morning. Good morning. It's always fun to get used to the new mic, right? Well, I'm really, really excited to be here with you today. <laughs> we got some amens going on already. <laughs> Makes it easy to preach. <laughs> now, I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, it's always a, a pleasure, regardless of, of, of what the circumstance, but it's always a pleasure to be able to, to worship with fellow brothers and sisters of Christ. Um, to share in a fellowship that bonds us in ways that we can't even see or imagine sometimes. Um, and so I'm just really excited to be here with you today. Sounds like that's going to be a little spot right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so my name is Ethan uh, Colvin. Actually, I, I do have some family with me today, if you look over there. Uh, my, my father and my mother and my brother and his, his wife and their two kids. Um, so we're, we're trying to make up with some extra kids in the, in the room. <laughs> um, yeah, like Alan said, my, my wife Jennifer, who is uh, definitely the prettier of the two, <laughs> um, she couldn't be here with us today because she's she's actually sick as well and she's watching the sick kids so uh, definitely pray for her because she's also eight months pregnant as well <laughs> um, so I, I have a three year old daughter uh, her name is Allison and she is absolutely gorgeous um, in both appearance and personality I have a uh, an 18 month old son Henry um, who is uh, definitely a redhead um, he is he is one angry little dude. Um, so he spends more time in time out than, than I think I did my entire life. <clears throat> um, so, but he's, he's got some spunk, but he's, he's a good little dude. Uh, and then, of course, uh, on the way is, is baby Jane. And so we're really excited to, to welcome her as well into our house. And it's just, it's a joy uh, to be a father. And it's a joy to, to be able to, to even experience that. And I think it, um, it, it kind of gives you a lot of different sermon illustrations and things like that as well, because you get to experience life a little bit more in hardships than, <laughs> than not. Um, but I won't talk too much about them today. Hopefully over the course of our time together, you know, in, in the coming weeks and, and hopefully even in the coming years, regardless of, of however today goes and however uh, the situation arises, but hopefully in the, in the coming time we can actually grow to, to know more about each other. So I will share a little bit about my past, but I won't go too much into detail because it's not about me, right? It's not about me. Um, I just want to share enough to let you know who I am. So for me, actually, I, I, I went to Wilson. So I don't know what you guys are. Yeah, we got some Wilson people. Woo! <laughs> um, I went to Wilson, graduated from there. I actually went to JMU for a year, and then I, I ended up. Yeah. Yeah, they just won yesterday, too. So. Woo! Um, and so then I actually went on to, to go to Liberty uh, for six years, so yeah, um, you definitely know where the majority of my money goes, uh, to school day. Um, but yeah, so I, I went to Liberty, graduated from there, um, actually met my wife in high school in marching band, um, I always say we kind of have a Ruth and Boaz experience, so I used to play the biggest bass drum, and so I couldn't tie my shoes, so she would tie my shoes for me, <laughs> so she is beyond sweet, um, she is a gentle and kind soul, uh, someone who I did not deserve. Um, and you guys, even even if whatever the circumstance, you will both recognize that immediately. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Um, you know, I think I, I had a pretty normal childhood. I did grow up in Cremora, so I, you know, kind of like Shrando and, and, and Lyndhurst. You know, it's it's out in the sticks. Um, you know, we're called Cremorons, actually. <laughs> See, never heard that, Will. I guess I gave it up already. Um, so I, I'm just a, a Cremoron who grew up in the sticks. Um, but what I can tell you is that I, I had a pretty fairly normal childhood. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time outside playing sports, and uh, I can remember shooting uh, basketball a lot. That was kind of a big thing that I would do. You know, I watched TV and play video games as well as most kids my age did growing up. I uh, didn't have Facebook and all that, but um, you know, I can remember. <coughs> You know, being in the backyard playing basketball by myself. And I don't know how many games I won as a member of the UNC Tar Heels, um, as well as a member of the Lakers, because Shaquille O'Neal was my favorite basketball player, right? And so I don't know how many games I won. I mean, honestly, I couldn't keep up with all the game-winning shots that I hit. 
Um, and so it's, it's kind of funny because I think, you know, growing up we have this, this mindset that kind of the, everything's for the taking, so to speak. We kind of have this, this big ideal of what our life is to become. We kind of have this, this mindset that we can do anything, right, that we set our mind to. And a lot of that's built on what our parents tell us and what society tells us. You know, you can do anything you want. Uh, part of the issue is I didn't go, I didn't become seven feet tall, so I couldn't quite be Shaquille O'Neal. Um, am I still, is it off? No. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't quite become seven feet tall. And, and I think as, as you kind of progress in life, you begin to realize that that the realities of life don't always measure up to what you think life is going to be when you're a kid. And what people tell you, yeah, this guy right here. Because whether it's whether it's at an early age that you realize this, uh, whether it's, you know, middle school is kind of a rough time for a lot of kids, right? It's high school. And then you get into the adult world and you have those. And then life is really like, what in the world's going on here? I thought this was supposed to be easy, <laughs> right? And so... We, we come to this realization that life isn't perfect and that there are things that we can't do, right? Because there's this mindset that everyone tells us that we can do anything we put our mind to, but it's, it's a false reality, right? You know, as much as I wanted to play center on the Los Angeles Lakers because it was what Shaquille O'Neal did, it's not possible, right? Because there's limitations that we all face in life, whether physical, whether emotional, Whatever the case is, right? There's these things that kind of pop up in our lives. And so, you know, I, I thought it was, it was really interesting just some of this, the things that were spoken of even before the, the service and during the service. And I feel like it's amazing. Uh, most of the time when you preach, I think a lot of times people have the mindset that the preacher's there to bless the people. But in, in fact, in all, in all honesty, it's the preacher who gets blessed by them by the service and by the people and everything that goes on in the process. Because it's there that you realize that you might think you have a plan or an idea, um, and it, as long as you're trusting in Christ, in this, you, you may think you have something going on, but Christ is doing something much bigger than you could ever think or imagine. Right? He's working in a way that that I, I don't even know what's going on. I, I was telling uh, Alan earlier, it's you kind of just catch on and, and hope that, that that God is that you're you're with God essentially, right? <clears throat> because there's there's so much that's going on behind the scenes and in the hearts of people, and there's so many struggles and there's so many weaknesses and there's so many inadequacies, inadequacies. There's so many things that we're powerless against, right? And so for me, you know, I I got to this point in my life when when I started to realize that life wasn't quite adding up to what I thought it was. I wasn't quite the best at, at any particular sport. I was, I was fairly decent, but it, it wasn't like NFL worthy. It wasn't NBA worthy. And so all these dreams and hopes that I had for this certain type of life obviously kind of went out the door. And then you realize, well, I'm not quite the best at anything. I'm good at a lot of things, I feel like, but I'm not quite the best at anything because there's always someone that's better than you at some point. And so we come to this, this reality, especially in my own life, this experience that, that life isn't quite what I thought it was going to be. And so I, I got into this position when, you know, I was an 11th grader and I, I kind of tore up my knee. I used to play soccer, if you can believe that or not. You can, you can pick my brother. He was a big soccer player, so that's what kind of, kind of got me. But I, I felt like I was on crutches for at least half the year. It was like forever. Because, you know, if you're not an NBA or, or a professional player, you know, if you have something like a simple knee surgery, it takes like three months. Um, and so I, I felt like I was on crutches forever. And in the midst of all this, I had so many things that just kept popping up. And our family was kind of dealing and struggling with a lot of different things as well that many of you probably have faced. And, kind of, and I can remember just laying in my bed at night, just simply thinking and contemplating. You know, I, I would cry out to... To, to something or someone. You know, what, what is the purpose of my life? Why am I here? I, I didn't understand. Because I thought life was supposed to be a little easier than it was. And so I'd gotten to this point, and I was kind of 
in, in, a, in a deep way, in a, in a way of weakness, in a way of inadequacy, knowing that I was powerless against the things that were coming up in my life. And so I think throughout the congregation, we probably all can have similar circumstances and experiences to this, right? We've all had moments where we've experienced these, these times of trouble, these times where our hearts are yearning. We don't know what to do. And I think we've all come to this place. <coughs> not most of us have. And we've all had unique and different circumstances. We all have unique and different circumstances and trials. And we all face things at different times in life. And so what I think is, is interesting is that in the midst of all of this, we have to be able to understand that, that God does something incredible and amazing in those circumstances. He does something that we can never think or imagine. Just like today, it's I'm, I'm always amazed at how God weaves together a service, uh, not of my own boasting, but of His. <coughs> right? Not of my own boasting, but of His. Now, I think, I think Job 5.7 is kind of a, a, a verse that kind of stands out to me. It says, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. You know, it, it surely is the fire, the flames uh, fly upward. There's trouble in life, right? And so I think the reality is we, we, we all come into this point. We all have these things that, that, that pop up. And I think, I, I, you know, like I said, I would love to tell you more of my story at this time for minutes as, as, as we kind of grow in this relationship. But what I can tell you is that the Lord gave me something in my time of weakness, in my time of, of, of self-inward um, thought process. He gave him gave me his son. He gave me his son. Right? Christ saved me. Christ bought me. Just like he's bought most of you in this room, if not all. Right? At some point in your life, you're at, a, at your wit's end. Or, or some of you, maybe you grew up in the church, but at some point, Christ purchased your soul. Amen? I know you guys like to say amen a lot, so... I listened a little bit to, to Alan. Now, he did tell me I had two hours. Is that okay? <laughs> so all those funny faces probably go towards you at about hour and uh, 30 minutes. Right? We're used to it. We're used to it. <laughs> I thought I heard him, you know, at like 12, 30, 1 o'clock driving down the road. But Alan's a good guy. He was actually the shortest out of everyone that was on the list. Yeah. Um... Sorry, kind of focus back in, right? Um, that's what happens with, 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 with preachers. You get on these little rabbit trails and you don't know where you're at. We're used to that, too. <laughs> <laughs> See, what's funny is he told all of you guys to make faces at me, but what really happened? God took a man, a young man, full of insecurities that warped my every thought and action. And he showed that man he had security in him. He took a young man who sought for so much acceptance and success. And he took that young man and he showed him that he was a child of God. He took that young man who felt he had no purpose in life. And he gave him a future beyond tomorrow. You see, I... It's amazing. I, I love to hear people's stories, right? Because it's, it's the story of how God has intervened in our lives. It's the story of how God has saved us from our situation, both now and forever. And so this is kind of a, a really important concept to us as believers in the church, right? But what's, what's interesting is so as we, we, we kind of can see this is that God absolutely, uncontrollably loves us, right? He cares for us deeply. But in the same regard, He also, in His love for us, He also requires His glory to be praised. Right? And so I think oftentimes we can kind of get into a situation where we see these two as, as opposing factors. Right? God's sovereign glory, God's sovereign power versus God's love for people. Right? And so these two things can sometimes be at, at odd ends, it seems. 
But in, in many ways throughout Scripture, we see these paradoxes that exist. Because in God's power and in God's glory, we also see God's love manifest in them, right? We see both of these things working together. Isaiah 48, 11 says, For my own sake, even for my own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Right, so there's this, there's this facet in which God requires that his glory be praised, that it be proclaimed, that it be uplifted, because it stands as a contrast to our own glory as well. Right? Also, I, I, I read in, in John chapter 17, 24, in Jesus' prayer to the Father, he says, Father, I will that they also, who thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. Right? There's this, there's this seemingly contrast that exists between God's glory and, and God's love, but when we actually look a little bit deeper, we see that his love is interwoven within his glory. So much so that when we actually look at John chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, this is just kind of a precursor until we get to uh, what I really want to talk about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. But what we see... In John chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, the story of Lazarus. And it says, Now a certain man was sick, sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days in the same place where he was. And what's interesting is we know that, that in Jesus' waiting, Lazarus ends up dead. When we know the complete entirety of the context of the story, we know that Jesus would later go on to, to raise Lazarus from the dead, right? We have the benefit of that. But if you would for a second, if you think about the process that's involved, we see this element in which these people who deeply love Jesus and who are deeply loved by Jesus send for him, and he doesn't come. And they know his power is sufficient to save their brother. And in the midst of it, I think there's a few things that kind of pop up in kind of an immediate reading of the text. The first is that Jesus chose to let Lazarus die. Mm -hmm. The second is that he was motivated by God's glory to do this. And the third is that his motivation was built in love. It's a difficult thing when we look at the beginning as opposed to just the entire world. Like I said, because it's you know, I think a lot of times we can, we can parallel this to our own lives, right? There's a lot of things that can kind of pop up in our own lives where we, we begin this process of thinking, Lord, what's going on? Like, I know you're faithful, but what's, what's going on? Right, we know later that Lazarus was raised from the dead. But the important thing we actually see is actually found in verse 4 when Jesus says, The sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of Man might be glorified thereby. You see, in our weakness, in our frailty, in our moment of need, and in our darkest despair, that is when God's glory is most manifest in our lives. It's, it's a difficult proposition, right? To know and understand that in the midst of our weaknesses, God brings glory upon himself in a way that also brings love into our lives. Now, I, I can't say that without saying that, you know, it, it, it seems difficult. <coughs> it's difficult when a brother passes away. It's difficult when, when things of this life come upon us. When we realize that we're not all we thought we were cut out to be. When we have emotional trauma. When we have people who, who throw accusations against us. And it's, it's, it's difficult. And it's difficult in the process. But what I'm trying to tell you, and what I hope that we kind of see throughout the rest of this time, is that 
there's an element in which our weakness allows for God's glory to be built, and in that it shows His love for us. Right. And we see this as we go on to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. First, I just, I just want to pray for His word. Lord Jesus, we are thankful. Lord, we're thankful for Your word that You've given us. Lord, in its entirety, we're so thankful that that we have access to you, that we are able to experience you, that we are able to experience your presence, or that we can um, experience your grace, Lord, even in the midst of weakness. Lord, as, we, as we'll read from Paul, Lord, in, in our weakness, you're strong. And so, Father, we ask and pray that you would bless us, Lord, in a way that would allow for us to see you more clearly, Lord, in a way that would allow for us to, to put our more of our cares and our burdens upon you. Because we know that you're faithful to, to take them for us. But Lord Jesus, we may not leave our weaknesses, but we know that in our weakness you are there. Lord Jesus, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. You guys can count on your life. <coughs> Grab my water real quick while you guys do that. <coughs> I'm definitely the best off, but still got a little bit of a cold. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It is not expedient, me, expedient for me, doubtless, the glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such a one caught up in the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, or to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or that he hears of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures, therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, and in reproaches, and necessities, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow, right? I think there's sometimes when we read scripture, it's, it's so incredibly overwhelming that it's, it's almost hard to even to talk about it. And I think this is one of those passages. And, and in understanding the context of, of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, um, we, we kind of come to realize that this is probably one of the most powerful passages that Paul ever writes. And one in which there's so much uh, that's going on in, in, inside his heart. Because this is this is a time in which Paul is, is being accused. Right? If you go back to chapter 10, Paul is actually being accused of being a coward. When you come before us, you can't say anything, but you can write your letters away from us. Right? You're a coward. Not only are you a coward, but you've lied about your ministry. Not only do you lied about your ministry, but I don't even think you're a Christian. Right? Paul has all these accusations that are being thrown against him. And not only that, but the people that are throwing these accusations are boasting about the things that they're doing. They boast about their past. They boast about their, their services. They boast about their experiences. And they say, what do you have, Paul? And Paul, who's built this church for two years, and then leaves to go to Ephesus. Paul, who's built this church for two years, is, is almost flabbergasted. He actually goes to the, the church in Corinth, and, and he's being accused and no one stands up for him. 
and, and so he kind of almost leaves us as a, as a dog would leave with their tail between their legs in some regards. Because he's so upset. Because he's put and invested so much of his life into these people. And he's invested his life into these people. And he's given them love. And he's set his mind on them. But in response, he gets accusations that he's not even a believer. That he's kind of like a, a second class citizen of the kingdom. And so what's interesting is that we see Paul, who has this deep spiritual burden. His heart is so full of anguish and torment. And what's interesting is that we see this progression that takes place from chapter 10 to chapter 11 to chapter 12, where Paul is, is, is having to refute these accusations, not because of his own integrity. Paul could care less if, if someone would have an accusation against him. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to save the church. Right, because there's these false teachers and these false apostles that are coming in and, and trying to take over the church for the purpose of destroying his ministry, destroying the ministry of God. And so what we actually see is that Paul is having to feel these accusations in order that he might help some of these people come back to Christ. What a burden that is. What a burden it is when everyone around you is accusing you of things that you didn't even do. Right? And it's, it's interesting from our perspective to look back at this because we think of Paul as such a spiritual lord, this great, significant apostle. But when we look at the life of Paul, it's littered with all these things that are against him. Right? You know, if, if we think about, um, you know, a lot of times there's, there's churches or, or schools that will invite, um, will invite preachers or they'll invite speakers. And it's almost kind of like a red carpet type of treatment, right? But you have this man, Paul, who comes as a tent maker into the city of Corinth, which is not that much unlike our own in terms of the way in which our society works. It was very much sexually oriented. Um, they, they very much were into the goddess of love. And so there's, there's all these things that are kind of popping up. They're, they're big in philosophy. They're intelligent individuals. And Paul comes and he says, I, I don't offer you philosophy. I offer you Christ. I offer you something that I can't think of in my mind. I offer you Christ. And so through all of this, through, through all this love that he's exerting towards these people, and then it's, it's this reversal that takes place. Paul, you're nothing. And we agree with these other people who are telling you that you're nothing. And so we get to this point, and, and we actually see that Paul is having to, to combat these accusations. He's combating these accusations, and he's saying, Gosh, you know, Jesus never boasted about these things. And I don't even want to boast about these things. But if you're going to make me, I'm at least going to show you that, that I, I'm much more than you. You know, I, I'm much more of a Jew than you were. I've done more services than you have. We actually get to, to chapter 11, verse 23, and following it says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labor is more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent. And deaths more off. Of the Jews, five times I received forty stripes, save one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwrecks, a night and a day I have been in the deep. And journey is often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren, in witness and in pain, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger, thirst, in fastings often. And cold and nakedness. Man, wouldn't you want that life? <laughs> beside those things, and yeah, only beside those things, that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, care of the church. Wow. Right? Oh, besides all of that, I, I come under this, this role of, of leading the churches that I've, that I've set up. And now they're accusing me. Who is weak and I am not? Who is offended and I, not, and I burn not? We get this snapshot into the picture of Paul's soul. We get this snapshot into the picture of, of this incredible weakness that Paul is, is facing. And he's, he's at this point where we, we get into chapter 12. And we actually get to this point of, of, of spiritual experiences. 
And you can almost tell that Paul's just kind of like, I'm kind of done with this argument. I, I can boast about this. I can boast about anything. Because his relationship with God was, in, was impeccable, right? When we look at Paul, we see him as a, a stalwart of the church. Because his faith was impressive. And so we see Paul, he actually gets to the point where he's, he essentially is, is talking in third person about these mm -hmm. spiritual experiences. He's like, you guys have experienced this okay. Well, guess what? I have like a trump card pretty much. And he speaks in, in a third person because he's like, I, I can't boast of this. This is my relationship with Christ. Which is a, a, a strange place to be as a believer if you boast in your experience with Christ. And it's a place to be very weird. But Paul says, speaking of this other person, me, I went to the third heaven, whatever that is, right? I experienced God in a way that I can't even talk about. I experienced paradise. But for me to boast in that is foolishness. Because it doesn't matter. What matters is that I boast in Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it doesn't matter about my experience with Christ when I talk to other people. It's a way that we can use it as a testimony, but it's never a time to boast about it. You know, I spent three hours with the Lord this morning. Right? But we have people who do that. We have people who boast about their experiences in many different ways, right? And it comes to this point where Paul's like, it's, it's, it's just foolishness. Whatever you want to talk about boast, I can beat you, but I don't want to. Because it's not important. But I care for these people. I care for this church. So that you can leave. Right? Because I, I love these people. I love these people. And if you actually go down to, to verse 5, or verse um, 15 of chapter 12, he talks about, I would, I would show you more love, but you wouldn't return I only talk about this because I love you so much, but your love isn't responding back to me. But I desire and I long to see that you would come away from your chains, which you were just broken from. Paul says in verse 6, For though I would desire to glory, I will boast, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or that which he hears of me. He doesn't boast in this, in, in, in a sense of, of, of self-pride, because what it leads to is, is more pride. Right? And I think for most of us, we go through this experience of, of the valleys and the mountains. And in the, in the valleys, you don't need much help getting lower, right? Uh, but in the mountaintop experience, when we have these spiritual highs, it almost always seems that I'm met with such accusation, or I'm met with such utterances from Satan or his messengers. Because every time you get in that position, obviously it's a, it's a point of, of concern for him. But at the same time, what's interesting, and I think this is a really difficult idea for people to understand, but the idea that God actually uses Satan to draw us to himself. Mm -hmm. That's a hard concept, right? Read Job and that messes you up. Mm -hmm. Right? Read Paul and that messes you up. <clears throat> because the reality is, is that God is that God, God doesn't mean. The reality is, is that Satan uses even the good things in our lives to try to draw us away, to try to bring us down. Even with God's <laughs> word, even with Jesus. Wouldn't we expect it of ourselves as well? He uses good experiences. This this experience that Paul had was one of a, a, a marvelous display. I mean, could you imagine experiencing that? I mean, we will one day, but could you imagine experiencing that in your in your earthly body? I just went up to the third heaven today. Right? And so Paul, even though he says, I, I'm not going to boast about it, the Lord still sent a thorn. The Lord sent a thorn through the, the messenger of Satan so that he wouldn't be too conceited, so that he wouldn't be too overwhelmed with his own pride. 
this is a really hard thing to understand I think, as a believer in Christ. But it only becomes difficult when we don't understand that kind of our sole purpose in life is to glorify God, not to glorify ourselves. Right? It, it, it almost seems contrary to what everyone tells us, though, right? What the world teaches. Essentially, the world teaches us when you have these beautiful experiences, you boast about them profusely to the point that everyone knows about them. You did well in a, in, a, in a basketball game, for instance. It's good to talk about your stat one. You know, I had a triple double. Some of you may know what that is, some of you may not. But it's it's this idea in which there's this constant striving for success. There's this constant striving for us to be in a position of strength. Now, and I want to take a sidestep because what I'm saying by weakness. What we see in weakness in, in scriptures is not a weakness that is that's laziness. It's not a weakness that, that speaks of us being pushed by us because there's still a race for us to run. There's still preparation that, that goes into the race, and there's still a race that actually has to be done. You don't you don't actually go to the to the race without any preparation and then just say, oh, I'm done. Right? So that's not the point of weakness. Right? I, I, I want to make that clear. It's not a point of of, of oh, just let life kind of go and flow however it goes, right? But our society is filled with all of these ideas, these self-help books, right? Um, these pump-me-up graduation speeches. And this is a difficult one. Parents who tell their kids every day that they're perfect, and they're good, that's hard. Now, there are some really good kids, right? They do a lot of really good things. It's difficult because I love my kids. But they're not perfect. Even as beautiful as they are, they're not perfect. And they're going to make a lot of mistakes. And they're going to be a lot of insecurities. And there's going to be a lot of pain. And there's going to be a lot of anguish. There's going to be a lot of crying. I get lots of crying. <laughs> right? But it doesn't stop. <coughs> but our kids aren't perfect. They're not the best. They're extremely important. And they're wonderfully and beautifully made. But if we continue to tell our kids, and I'm thinking of this even from a youth standpoint, if we continue to tell our kids that they can be anything that they want to be, that they're perfect, that there's nothing that can stop them, then we're lying. We're lying to them. Because Paul, the, the, the man who can boast about anything, faces struggle. He faces <coughs> opposition. He faces adversaries. He faces these accusations that come against him that have no merit. Our kids are going to face the same thing and we face the same thing, so we'd be lying if we told them otherwise. So can't we be honest? Are we kind of sick of that? Because I can tell you one thing. How do those outside of the church view us? Right? Because there's something that's really important to you. You know, I, I used to help out with some kids at, at our, our old church. And <coughs> there's so much pain. But these kids are facing the group so many issues, and, and, I, and I know that you guys are facing some of the same things because they grew up to be just like you. Right? And so I know that there's all these things that people face in life, all these weaknesses, all these insecurities, all these things that come against them. And we as a church have, have done a, a disservice to say that we are good. You know, we walk out of the doors with, with heavy Bibles and, and we feel like we can stand up straight and say, I'm strong. You're not. We're not. And we do a disservice to people when we tell them we, that we have everything together. Well, we clearly don't. You see, we, our weakness is a display for His grace. Our weakness is a display for His glory. I think we miss that all the time. 
Because we want people to think that we're good, but you're not. You're only good because he's good. I think we miss a valuable opportunity for us to be vulnerable with people. Just as Paul is vulnerable before the people of Corinth. Most of us, if we were accused of such things, most of us, if, if we were berated in the way that Paul was, we wouldn't come back, right? But Paul loved them deeply. How are we portraying ourselves to outsiders, to people who don't know yet of the faith of Jesus Christ? You see, we have very little to offer them if we don't offer them God's power. Because there's, there's too many people out there that do good things. And if and this is, is something that's extremely vital for, for, for youth groups in particular, but also I see the trend within the church. To have these things that draw people in. There's things that can be used as tools for, for, for bringing people into the churches, but if, if all we're about is for people to have fun experiences, then we're missing the entire point. Because if we don't share our weaknesses and how God has glorified himself in those weaknesses, then we miss an opportunity to show people how they can experience the same thing. We have an opportunity to be vulnerable. <coughs> which absolutely feels terrible at the same time. I want to pose a couple of questions. Could your weakness and sense of inadequacy actually prove to be an asset for the kingdom or for your home? I just want to pose it in a different way. Have you ever considered that your limitations or your handicaps, they prove to be the key to your usefulness in the service of Christ? And I, I, I could probably point to every single person here today say, you have something that you think is an inadequacy for the gospel. I'm too quiet. I'm too young. I'm too old. I have a disability. Right, we look all throughout scripture and we can see the people who are screwed up and don't have anything that are used for the kingdom. From the Old Testament to the New Testament. We have stuttering leaders. <laughs> right, and so we have to get to this, this element in this moment in which we understand that our weaknesses are actually strengths for the kingdom. And in those weaknesses, what, what we do instead of covering them up is that we actually highlight them. Like I said, it's difficult. I don't have this together, guys. I'm working on it. Which is what we should be doing. We have to have more transparency as the body. We have to be more willing to, to divulge our hearts. And di divulge the things that, that we kind of hold tight because we don't want other people to know. And I'm not talking about willful sin. Right? I want to make that clear. It, your weakness isn't a willful sin. <coughs> but there are weaknesses that exist within all of us, in all of our character, in all, all of our personality, in our physical appearance. There's weaknesses that exist, and they exist, exist for a reason. I do want to, to mention real quick this, this thorn of the flesh that Paul's talking about. That I, I could give you a, a nice little fun analogy of what it probably is, but I have no clue. No one does, right? There's a lot of things that people think it is. But what I think it does is it actually, Paul's not trying to boast about this thorn. He's just saying, I have a thorn. And because what it's doing is it's allowing for us to see in our context, the context that we too can have a thorn in our flesh. Right? Because Paul's not the only one with this problem. What I think is also interesting is the parallel that exists between Paul and Jesus. 
as Paul asked three times that this would be taken away, Jesus also asked three times in the garden that this would be taken away. And in both occasions, God says no. And that's hard. Right? I, I think we live in, in a, a time in which people want the self-gratification of there's an injury or there's something going on. God, heal me. And he does heal. But he doesn't always heal. We want to be stronger. We want to be more encouraged. We want to have these different things. But sometimes those things are there for a purpose and a reason. And God's not going to give uh, that, that freedom. Because he's going to use it as an opportunity for his glory and for our strength in him. So there's an interesting parallel that exists there. But in both cases, God's grace is more than sufficient. Amen. If, if God's grace was more than sufficient for Jesus to die on the cross and be raised from the dead, how much more so is His grace sufficient for us? My grace is sufficient to leave. My strength is made perfect in weakness. I do want to make it clear as well, though, that it doesn't it doesn't relieve pain necessarily. It doesn't relieve heartache. Paul didn't lose the Lord. He just gained Christ. Mm-hmm. Right? The, the more and more that, Christ, that, that Paul became weak, the more and more that he was filled with this strength and glory that comes only through God. Because this is, this is kind of the, the piece, right? It's, it's kind of hard to, to think about this because when we're looking at this from, from the way in which we've been, been brought up, the way in which our culture tells us how to live, it's a very difficult thing for us to tell ourselves to be weak, to not to be strong. It's difficult for us to tell ourselves to be weak. But the weaker we become, the stronger Christ becomes in us. Now, this is not a very literal form, right? If you want to be weak for God, if you don't want to be anything for God, do this. Convince yourself that you have it all together. Tell yourself that you're strong. Tell yourself that you're smart. Tell yourself that the world is waiting to discover you. But what happens is that your head will grow so large and your heart will become so hard that you won't even know what happens to yourself. And I think about King Nebuchadnezzar. As he's standing uh, on the balcony, he says, look at this Babylon that I have built for myself. Mm-hmm. And a few chapters later, he's eating the grass. And he's acting like an animal. Because what seems like a strength now will be a weakness later. Mm -hmm. And it won't be a weakness for Christ. Unless you give yourself up to it. What actually happens with Nebuchadnezzar is that after, I believe, seven years, he comes to the point and he looks upon heaven. And he he, he gets a sanity back. And he praises God because he realizes that he is finite and God is infinite. He had a warped perception of what his reality was. I, I, I think there's probably quite a few of you in here that haven't yet allowed for God to come into that place. And it may be something that, that I would never understand. And so I tread lightly in this area, right? Because I I know that there are things that hamper us. There are things that cause anguish and despair beyond anything imaginable. But the reality is that God's grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. Mm -hmm. In our weakness, not out of our weakness. That's difficult, right? In our weakness. Now, there are times when when God does take away our weaknesses, right? So I want to make that clear as well. There's times when God does take away our weaknesses. If I get down too quickly, I also talk to you. But God's grace is sufficient because His power is made perfect in our weakness.
interesting because we read that Jesus seems so counter to the way that we want to. Um, there's, there's times when, when Jesus, in front of crowds, and he has the opportunity for many people to follow, would say some really, really dumb things if he wanted to have a good following. Right? He would say things like, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and die every day. If you want to follow me, eat and drink of my blood. If you want to follow me, sell everything that you own and come with me. Because the reality is that the kingdom of heaven is not something that's easily stepped into. Not as easily as I think we think it is. Because the kingdom of, of heaven is, is something that's built for people who surrender to God. It's built for people who, in their weakness, allow Christ to strengthen them. Because here's a question that, that, that I recently uh, was um, exposed to that, that was really, really difficult to answer when you really think about it. If you had the opportunity to experience a utopia or a heaven in which you had perfect health, in which you had your friends and family forever, in which you had a blissful eternity without Jesus, because that's what it's about to be a Christian. Really, truthfully, allow your heart to ask that question because so many of us are, are built on this idea of, of not going to hell. But what we need to change our focus and our mindset to is that it's about God's glory. Mm -hmm. It's His glory. It's not our own glory. We experience our own glory when we think about these ideas of, of spending life in paradise. That's our own built imagination of glory. And it cannot exist with His cannot exist with His glory because He cannot share His glory with us. Like I said earlier, I think it's, it's extremely interesting to point out that God uses Satan for His own benefit. Because Satan thinks he's doing something for his own, but what he's really doing is he's actually playing in God's hand. This, this entire concept is so difficult. And like I said, I, I, I'm just, I'm beginning, right? This road of sanctification, this, this road. Just like all of you have. At least hopefully all of you. But this <coughs> road that, that speaks into um, understanding how all of this works, right? To the point of glory, to the point of glorification. Thank God that he finishes the work for us. He does the work for us. All we have to do is surrender to There's a, an interesting quote by Samuel Wilson in the 18th century. I thought it was uh, really interesting. He says, A Christian never falls asleep in the fire or in the water. It grows drowsy in the sunshine. I think that the present reality for us is that we exist in a, in a place where it's easy to be comfortable. It's easy to experience the sunshine. Because we don't have to do anything to serve Christ. We can, <coughs> we can get saved and just kind of live our life, right? Because it's easy here. We live in a great country that allows for a lot of freedoms. <clears throat> and that's why, you know, Jesus talks about the idea that it's, it's more difficult for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. It's more difficult for those who feel like they can rely on their own strength to enter my kingdom. Because if you can rely on your own strength, then you don't need me. At least you feel like you don't need me. <coughs> and so that's why we see almost always that these great revivals happen within areas that, that have such poor lifestyles or, or, or has such um, times of, of despair. There's, weak, there's some weakness, right? There, there seems to be so weakness. And that's where the gospel seems to flourish as people who need God, right? We all need God. But for people who want to feel comfortable, you don't want to be with God, Right? 
because it's easy. Then I have to worry about a thorn in the flesh because God gave it to you so he can be glorified, right? Uh, who wants that? People who want to glorify God. <coughs> and so I think that's that's kind of the, the, the really the question that, that kind of that kind of really comes into focus is are we willing to allow ourselves to be in, a, in an element of weakness, to be entirely surrendered in weakness so that Christ can be made strong in us. Have you ever considered that your limitations or your handicaps may prove to be the key to your usefulness for the service of Christ? There's a reason God uses old clay pots. Mm -hmm. Because there's no denying who put the power in it. Mm -hmm. Right? There's many, there are many people who want to make the pot shiny and beautiful. But what they fail to realize is that a pot is meant to hold something greater than itself. Amen. <laughs> Would you be an old clay pot? Maybe there's a question, another question for some of you. Have you ever honestly, in full surrender, offered your life to God? I'm going to tell you it's not easy. I, when I dealt with the, the team that I used to work with, I, I never wanted to sugarcoat something because I didn't want to get them into something that wasn't actually Jesus. If you want to die every day to yourself, then follow Jesus. If you want to be glorified less and boast less of your, of your own things, then follow Jesus. If you want to make it so that someone else gets all your glory, then follow Jesus. But if you want to live comfortably, if you want to, to be able to do everything that you'd ever want to imagine in life, don't follow Jesus. Because right? that's ultimately what it comes down to. Are you willing to give up your ability to boast in yourself so that you can boast in Christ? Because it's not just about us. Honestly, it's not about us at all. It's about Him. It's about him crucified in weakness so that he could proclaim his glory and power in the resurrection. Amen. So that we could have life with him and experience his presence forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. It's to experience him in the fullness of his presence. What a day that will be, right? But there's a little bit of a journey that takes a long time. We gotta keep working. I kind of want to close out in a, in a quote um, by Saint Patrick. It's a quote that uh, a pastor used to, to always use. I really, I really like it. I wish I could say it by memory, but I can't. Um, so just, it's, it's beautiful. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ on my right, Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down. Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the, the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in the, the every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. <coughs> That's what we're working towards. So that he can have the glory. I just pray today that you guys go in peace and as, as, as you guys are making the decision, as you guys are, are moving forward with Christ as a body of believers, I pray that you guys will become weak so that he can become strong. Amen.